Ecuador's National Electoral Council moves forward the campaign for the presidential candidates and extends the process that begins this Thursday by more than a month. Peruvian Congress approves law allowing foreign military personnel to enter the country. And in Sudan's western Darfur region, mass graves were found with over 80 bodies. Women and children were among the victims. Hello, welcome from the south. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Lesu Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. In Ecuador, the Electoral Authority announced that presidential candidates can start campaigning this Thursday for the August 20th elections. The National Electoral Council extended the electoral campaign by more than a month after confirming that all the appeals had been resolved. The process was originally scheduled for August 8th to the 17th. The Electoral Authorities also decided to increase the Electoral Promotion Fund. Two councillors, Elena Najera and Estela Acero, abstained because they considered that the decision violated the political rights of the organizations. On Wednesday, the UN Security Council gave an important endorsement to Colombia's peace policy. The endorsement came during the presentation of the report of the UN Verification Mission in Colombia. The Colombian Foreign Minister Álvaro Leiva and Civil Society Representative Diana Salcedo also took part in the event. Carlos Ruiz Maceo, head of the office, emphasized that the implementation of the peace agreement is gaining momentum and that the efforts deployed through the total peace policy are yielding important results. On Wednesday, the Permanent Commission of the Peruvian Congress approved a law authorizing the entry of naval units and foreign military personnel into the country. The legislative proposal was approved with 22 votes in favor, 2 against and 4 abstentions. The motion was presented directly by the executive and therefore, according to the rules of procedure, does not require a second vote. The norm was discussed and approved to allow the participation of Colombian military personnel in the Colombia-Peru 2023 Binational Development Day, but it opens the door to all missions around the world. The President of Congress, Jose Williams, assured that this will always be civic actions in support of the population. In Peru, the 7th Constitutional Court of Lima upheld the ban of marches in the center of the capital. The Peruvian government announced a ban on marches and rallies that could endanger public welfare and security. It also urged social organizations to mobilize in other parts of the city. George Malvina Saldana reiterated that the city council's decision was perfectly legal since its purpose was to protect the historical and monumental heritage of the center of Lima. The right to peaceful protest has not been restricted or suspended by this agreement, as such protests can take place in other areas of the capital. The center of Lima is usually the site of the most emblematic demonstrations in Peru. In fact, the focal point is Plaza San Martin, one of the city's most representative public spaces. In Brazil, former President Jair Bolsonaro testified before the federal police investigation of the attempted coup d'etat, which sought, among other things, to annul the last elections to prevent the inauguration of President Lula da Silva. In February, Senator Marcos Duval stated that Bolsonaro invited him to participate in a meeting and proposed him to record a conversation with the president of the electoral power, Alexander de Moraes, in order to seek the annulment of the presidential elections. Likewise, one of Duval's versions states that the proposal of a coup attempt came from former President Jair Bolsonaro. Meanwhile, Bolsonaro declared about his participation in the coup acts during the attack to the headquarters of three powers on January 8th. In Mexico, a drug cartel set off a coordinated series of seven roadway bombs in western Mexico that killed four police officers and two civilians, officials said on Wednesday. Luis Mendez, the chief prosecutor of Jalisco State, said the blast late Tuesday in the township of Talojomulco were so powerful they left craters in the road, destroyed at least four vehicles and wounded 14 other people. Mendez also said the two dead civilians were in a vehicle that happened to be passing the spot when the bombs detonated in La Jamulco near the state capital of Guadalajara. Enrique Alfaro, the governor of Jalisco State, said an anonymous caller who gave a volunteer search group a tip about a clandestine burial site near the roadway set a trap for the officers.
The construction of a dam to guarantee fresh water to the people in Uruguay is underway in the face of the water crisis the nation is experiencing. The works are being carried out after the government rejected the aid offered by several countries to face the worst drought in the last 50 years. Authorities indicated that they are waiting for the rains to come so that the water reservoirs can recover their levels. The crisis is due to the lack of rainfall. The South American nation has been suffering for several months, leaving fresh water reserves at their historic minimum levels. The lack of the vital liquid has caused serious disruptions in the lives of the Uruguayan people. Colombia's Environment Minister Susana Muhammad said during a press conference on Wednesday that her country reduced deforestation by 29 percent between 2021 and 2022. The minister highlighted that Colombia had lost 123,517 hectares of forest in 2022, the lowest figure since 2013, although the Amazon continues to be the hardest hit region. Mohamed said the reduction was due to a change of a government strategy led by the country's president, Gustavo Petro. The president seeks to curb deforestation by increasing the presence of the state and the security forces in the regions where mafias operate, destroying the vegetation to make way for cattle raising, maintain drug crops, or sell the timber. Petro is also an advocate of making jungle protection agreements with communities in exchange for large sums of money, which the government hopes to obtain from international cooperation. Let's take now a short break, but remember you can join us on TikTok at Telesur English, where you will find news in different formats, news updates, and much more. All the stories are coming up, stay with us. Welcome back from the South. On Thursday, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov warned that the Western bloc's F-16 fighter jets transfer to Ukraine will be considered a nuclear threat as these aircraft are capable of carrying nuclear weapons. The head of the Russian diplomacy addressed in particular the United States, the United Kingdom and France, pointing out that they are aware of the capabilities of these aircraft. Lavrov assured in an interview to Russian media that the appearance of these systems in the Ukrainian armed forces will be considered as a threat from the Western powers in the nuclear field. In a sense, he specified that Russia has clearly defined the conditions for the use of these weapons in its military doctrine. Increase attention to the comprehensive rural reform. Russia denounced NATO of returning to Cold War schemes after the results of its last summit held in Lithuania. In this context, Moscow affirmed that it will increase its defense capability to respond with all means to the decisions of the warmongering entity. The Russian Foreign Ministry stressed that the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is unwilling to tolerate the formation of a multipolar world. They also indicated that under the pretext of a threat allegedly coming from the East, the United States and its allies want to use NATO as an instrument of hegemony in international affairs. In this sense, they affirmed that NATO's attitude causes a series of concerns to the other countries due to the fact that the policy, actions, and military construction of the alliance contradict the objective task of forming a new just world order. Russia announced on Wednesday that its army had received more than 2,000 pieces of military hardware from the Wagner Group following the group's short-lived insurrection last month. According to the Russian Ministry of Defense, the equipment includes hundreds of tanks, Grad and Uragan multiple rocket launcher systems, Panzer anti-aircraft systems, self-propelled artillery systems, armored personnel carriers, among others. All materials have been transported to the rear areas where maintenance units of the Russian armed forces will prepare them for further use. On the night of June 23rd and the 24th, the Wagner Group forces captured the headquarters of Russia's southern military district in the city of Rostov-on-Don, after the head of the private military company accused the Russian armed forces of launching missile attacks on the group's camps, which both the Defense Ministry and the Russian Federal Security Service denied. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres sent a letter to Russian President Vladimir Putin on July 11th, proposing a way forward for the implementation of the Russian part of the Green Deal. 
According to the spokesman for the Secretary General, Stefan Jarek, the group also aims at removing hurdles affecting financial transactions through the Russian Agricultural Bank, a major concern expressed by the Russian Federation, and to simultaneously allow for the continued flow of Ukrainian grain through the Black Sea. On July 22, 2022, a package of documents on the supply of food and fertilizers to the international market was signed in Istanbul. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said earlier that the extension of the grain deal was out of the question unless the Russian package of the Istanbul agreements was enforced, adding that the deal was still being implemented only regarding the supply of Ukrainian grain. The, spoke the spokesman for the UN Secretary General, Stefan Juradic, said that vulnerable people around the world remain being his main concern and that he will do everything possible for the ratification of the agreement. For his part, the Secretary General will continue to stress the critical importance of food and fertilizer exports from both the Russian Federation and Ukraine to global food security. His overriding concern remains for vulnerable people around the world who stand to lose the most from any unraveling of the Istanbul arrangements and a likely subsequent rise in global food and fertilizer prices. The Secretary General remains engaged with all relevant parties on this issue and expresses his willingness to further engage on his proposal with the Russian Federation. In Switzerland, the Human Rights Council of the United Nations condemned the burning of the, Korea, of the Koran in Sweden. The council issued this resolution rejecting the act of burning the Koran and other acts of religious hatred in the region, although some countries expressed that it would be an abuse of freedom of expression. It also stated that this decision was adopted after a debate requested by Pakistan on behalf of several countries of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation following the incident of the burning of the Koran in front of a mosque in Stockholm. In the end, the order was approved by 28 of the 47 council members, while some members abstained and 12 voted against. Antelesor English launched its own videos on the man site. For you to go and revisit our interviews, top stories, special broadcastings, and more. Just go to the top left corner in our website homepage and click on the video option to access our VOD platform. We will now take a final short break, so don't go away. Welcome back from the South. In Sudan, a report to which the United Nations Human Rights Office grants full credibility claims that at least 87 Masalits were buried in mass graves in western Darfur. Residents of El Ganeina region claim they were executed by parliamentary rapid support forces. Residents themselves buried them in mass graves as their exposed bodies were decomposing in open view of everyone. 37 victims were buried on June 20th and 50 others, including 7 women and 7 children, were buried on June 21st in the Ranga area. The High Commissioner for Human Rights has called on the parliamentarians to allow and facilitate a rapid search for the deceased. <laughs> The head of the UN mission in Sudan, Volker Perthes, says the Sudan conflict could turn into an ethnic and tribal civil war as warning sites step up efforts to recruit fighters. He describes the situation as a stalemate where both sides still think that if they can mobilize a bit more, they could win over the other. Fighting has raged in Sudan since mid-April when Army Chief Abdel Fattah al burhan and his former deputy Mohammed Hamdan Daglo, who commands the parliamentary rapid support forces, turned on each other. Around 3,000 people have been killed and the UN has warned of possible crimes against humanity in the western region of Darfur. Both parties cannot, or so it seems, win militarily with what they have in terms of manpower. So both parties have been recruiting beyond their own formations on an ethnic basis, a tribal basis, or even an ideological basis. So here we are um, at the verge of this war between two military formations morphing into an ethnicized and tribalized civil war. So that none of the parties have been able, has been able for the last three months to win a decisive 
victory. Uh, if you look at the map in Khartoum, it's, it's almost unchanged from what it was on 16 April or so. So this stalemate is not a, a hurting, a mutually hurting stalemate, so that both parties would feel uh, obliged or forced to enter into negotiations. It is a stalemate where both sides still think that if they can mobilize a bit more, if they can resupply themselves better, they could win over the, over the other side. The head of the UN mission in Sudan also referred to the last meeting held in Cairo to bring together all the countries affected by the conflict in order to achieve a unified position. With the uh, recent meeting in, in, in Cairo, the aim here is to get all the neighbors of Sudan together, and that is something we have actually been, been asking for as United Nations, and which is important because um, all neighbors are impacted by the war, they have different concerns, different interests. It's very important to have a conversation between these neighbors whether one could get uh, a, a unified stance, a unified position on on stopping that war, on ending this war, despite the different concerns and the different interests. The presidents of Kenya and Iran pledged on Wednesday to strengthen bilateral ties and to sign a number of trade agreements. The statement was made during Iranian President Brian Raisi's maiden visit to the East African nation. Raisi described his visit as a turning point in the development of relations between the countries and said his talks with Kenya's President William Ruto reflected the determination and resolve of both countries for expansion of economic and trade cooperation, political cooperation and cultural cooperation. On the other hand, Ruto described Iran as Kenya's critical strategic partner. The Iranian president is also due to travel to Uganda and Zimbabwe this week on the first Africa tour by an Iranian leader in 11 years. The productive visit has been an excellent opportunity for us to renew and reaffirm the strong bonds of friendship and solidarity between the governments and people of Kenya and Iran. Today, President Raisi and I have witnessed the signing of five memoranda of understanding on cooperation in information, communication and technology, fisheries, animal health and livestock products and investment promotion. These memoranda will enhance and further deepen our bilateral relations for sustainable growth and development between our two countries. These highly we believe that relations between Iran and Kenya could be strengthened on a daily basis. The African continent is full of capacity and opportunity. Despite all the threats and sanctions of our adversaries, we have managed to register advances in different fields, and today we should call Iran a technology hub. We have managed to overcome present sanctions and have also upgraded our status in different fields. In Kenya, the death rose to 375 after religious fasting in the Shakahohola forest in Kilifi. Authorities performed an exhumation of 12 more bodies related to the cult and religious fasting carried out in Lansling to Paul Mackenzie. Officials also confirmed that around 253 DNA samples have been taken. Finally, this exhumation phase resumed after a two-week pause by pathologists and homicide detectives. Officials added that the number of deaths could increase. The government of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea have said the intercontinental ballistic missile it launched on Wednesday was a Wasson-18, marking a potential new round of confrontation with Washington and its allies. The missile's 74 minutes flight time represents a marginal advancement on the one tested by the Northeast Asian nation in March and April of this year, both of which were also intercontinental ballistic missiles with enough range to potentially hit the continental United States. Wednesday's launch, which landed in waters near, Jap near to Japan, comes after earlier this week Pyongyang threatened to shoot down U.S. military reconnaissance aircraft engaging in what it called hostile espionage activities near its territory. Like this, we have come to the end of this news brief from you. You can find these and many other stories on our website, www.telesurenglish.net. Also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram, and TikTok. For Telesur English, I'm Luis Herbert Tomatos. Thank you for watching.